Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry at Harvard mm -hmm. Medical School. Dr. Grinspoon was the senior psychiatrist at Mass Me Me Mental Health Center in Boston for 40 years. Dr. Grinspoon is a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science, the American Psychiatric Association. He was the founding editor of the Annual Review of Psychiatry and the Harvard Mental Health Letter and edited that letter for 15 years. In 1990, Dr. Grinspoon won the Alfred R. Linda Smith Award for Achievement in the Field of Scholarship from the Drug Policy Foundation, and in 2012, the Cannabis Culture Award from the Hemp Museum in Barcelona, Spain. Dr. Grinspoon is the author of Marijuana Reconsidered, first published in 1971, and Marijuana, the Forbidden Medicine, which was published in 1993, which describes a variety of ailments for which cannabis ingestion may be indicated. Please join me in thanking and congratulating Dr. Lester Grinspoon. My voice is up to this task. Can you hear me back there? Uh, well, where should I start? First of all, let me congratulate all of you for participating in this extraordinary achievement to make marijuana legally available as a medicine in Massachusetts. This obviously gives me a lot of pleasure. I've been waiting a lot of years for this to happen. But um, I'm waiting for a more important event. Um, I, I've always wondered whether I would see it in my lifetime, and that is the complete legalization of that. Uh, you know, I'm inclined to believe uh, that uh, what we should have gone for at this time in Massachusetts was not medical marijuana, but the end of the prohibition of marijuana altogether. That doesn't mean the medical marijuana hasn't been important in getting us to this point. I mean, we're now at a point where more than 50% of citizens of this country are in favor of legalization. And in this state, uh, I'm sure there are people here who know this figure better than I, but I, as I understand, it's close to 60%. So I can't imagine that we can't do this right now if we had the energy after what we, and, the, and the means after what we've just finished. But you know, I think that, uh, that this might not have come about, this, this going up, it's almost going up exponentially, this, this uh, the uh, curve of uh, people who are interested in legalization. You know, when I first published on marijuana, that was in 1969. The first publication anybody read was in Scientific American in 1969. And at that time, the number of people who were interested in getting rid of the prohibition was about between 9 and 12 percent. And we were arresting about 300,000 citizens, most of them young, almost all of them for mere possession, uh, in this country annually. Of course, now it's up to 800, about 870,000. But, you know, I, I, I would wait, I, how is this going to happen? Uh, when is it going to happen? And marijuana reconsidered, I, I uh, predicted it would happen within 10 years. My closest friend, Carl Sagan, we read each other's manuscripts. He read marijuana reconsidered in manuscript form, and he said to me, Lester, that's a wonderful book, but you made one big error. What's that, Carl? You said it was going to take 10 years to get rid of prohibition. It's going to happen within two or three years at the most. So uh, I'm bad at those predictions, but in one area, Carl was worse. You know, the uh, when I published this book, I see it staring me in the face here, uh, when Jake and I published that in uh, the first edition of 1993, the first letter I got concerning that book, I can't remember the exact words. I remember the exact words 
uh, that was an email for this book, but for Marijuana Reconsidered, it was one line, no salutation, no uh, signature, you dirty Harvard Jew, you did it for the money. And boy, did that make an impression on me. When uh, the first email uh, concerning marijuana, the forbidden medicine, it was, it was also, uh, it wasn't nasty, but it was uh, certainly very critical of me. Uh, this uh, author thought that I had written this book uh, as a Trojan horse. Medical marijuana would be the Trojan horse toward legalization. And, you know, I, I, I couldn't believe this man saw me as being that Ma Machiavellian. It never occurred to me that it would, would have anything to do with legalization, or not, not, uh, not certainly very directly. But the fact of the matter is that the number of people interested in legalization has gone up so much because so many, and I don't take credit for this, but so many people have learned something about marijuana directly. For the first time, they've had an opportunity to see a relative or a friend or somebody use this horrible drug. And I, I have a wonderful story to illustrate that. It really brought it home to me. You know, at Harvard Medical School, once I published that first thing on marijuana, I, you know, I was like a, a pet monkey at a masquerade ball. Harvard Medical School didn't like it, and they made that clear to me. Um, and uh, many of the faculty uh, uh, took this view. It was uh, when this book came out. Uh, I was uh, call. I got a call from the associate dean in charge of Harvard Publications. I was on his committee because I was editor of the Harvard Mental Health Letters, as just mentioned. And um, he said to me, we, we, well, let me get to that. He said, uh, Lester, uh, I've just read the chapter in your book on, um, uh, I've just looked at your book, your book, Marijuana, the Forbidden Medicine, and I noticed you mentioned a substance called Marinol. Uh, or Granabino. He said, uh, my mother-in-law, who lives in Miami, is suffering from pancreatic cancer. And as most of you know, with pancreatic cancer is something we can do very little about, except make the patient as comfortable. That's the goal, to make the patient comfortable, because there's very little else that can be done. He said, and she's doing pretty well, except that she has chronic nausea. And it's really spoiling uh, her her uh, living uh, capacity. And he said, "You mention a, a book, you mention a substance called Marinol in the book. Would that be helpful to my mother-in-law, who is 67 years old?" And I said, "Well, uh, Steve, it uh, it might very well, but there's a better way to deal with nausea, and that is she could smoke marijuana." I can't describe what his reaction to that was, but he was very annoyed at me that I would even consider mentioning marijuana for his mother. And uh, so I said, okay, well, let me, and I, I provided him with the, what he needed to know about dosing her to overcome this. And fortunately, I concluded the conversation by saying, if she has any problem, Give her my telephone number and let me see if I can help out on the phone. About two weeks later, I got a call from this woman, and she said that uh, Marinol seemed to work uh, at first, but she's had to increase the dose, and, she, and it just doesn't work as well. I said, uh, Mrs. So and so, do you, uh, you have a. Is that mine? There she is. <laughs> Uh, do you have a grandchild who would be willing to teach you how to use marijuana? <laughs> and she said, I have a granddaughter who's been dying to get me to smoke marijuana. <laughs> I said, good, here's what to do. You, she has to come to your place, she has to teach you how to roll what's called a joint, and she has to teach you how to smoke it. Mm -hmm. And what I would suggest about this is, 
and I do this with all elderly people who are marijuana virgins at the time they want to begin to use marijuana, have her take one puff and just put it down for two or three minutes. It'll go out, that's okay. She lights it again, takes another puff, and she keeps up this rather time-consuming thing for a while until one of two things happens. Either she gets a little anxious or the nausea is relieved. And at that point, she stops. And uh, again, I urge if she had any problem to call me. Well, didn't hear anything more from her, but the next... Ali, uh, the editor, because I was one of the Harvard editors, we met in this, this, this associate dean's office about once every two months. And uh, at the next meeting, uh, he asked me to stay a little after the other people had left. And uh, he told me, he said, Lester, I can't tell you how indebted we are to her. This has really been uh, such a godsend for her. And... Uh, then along came a, uh, some other medical problem in Miami. Uh, he medevaced her up to the Mass General, which is where he, we all have clinical offices in different hospitals. And she was at the Mass General. And uh, by this time they decided when she finished, she would live with them in water. Now, uh, with her daughter and son of law. Now, uh, I, I had heard nothing more about her except that I heard that she died about two or three months after she moved up. Uh, Steve always had a Christmas party. Uh, when my wife and I went up the stairs to the Christmas party, there, there was, I'm sorry about that, if I knew enough to turn this off, let's see. Maybe I can. Push the button. There's a button here. Yeah, push it and then go off. Now it's just vibrating. <laughs> you can't hear uh, when we walked in the door to his Christmas party, his wife said to me, in almost the exact words, Lester, we're so indebted to you for, for helping my mother get started on. And then she went on to tell me the story. Uh, she has three boys. One's a doctor, one's a lawyer, and uh, the third one is a landscape architect. They're wonderful young men, and not so young men. Uh, and uh, um, she told me that uh, when they were in college, she raised holy hell with them because she heard they were smoking marijuana and she would not put up with it. And she told me how, how, how rash her behavior toward them was. And she said, you know, and then she's using marijuana. The boys come in, two of them are in town. They sit by the kitchen table and roll up the joint. She had a little trouble with it. She'd be for the rest of the week and they'd sit around and smoke, and they were having a great time. And she says, I feel like such a damn fool. What was all the fuss about? Why? Well, then the, the uh, coda to the story is that last year, uh, uh, oh, and Barbara, the, uh, the, the wife, died uh, a few years ago. And um, last year, I bumped, bumped into the associate dean. Now, he's also a marriage. And he was with a woman, she was a younger woman, and uh, she recognized that she knew me. And, uh, she, and she said, you know him? Could we meet him? And so they came, came over, and uh, it was clear that uh, she, was talk she started to talk about her own use. And he, the associate dean, who was so uh, annoyed with me uh, because of all of this marijuana stuff, he said, he, he looks up at me and he said, Lester, I use it too now. So, you know, medical marijuana has gone a long ways in helping people to appreciate that this substance is not a curse, it's a blessing. It's not just a blessing medically, but it's the best recreational drug anybody has ever invented if you take the numbers of people and the consequences it's, as we all know, it's a great recreation drug. As many of us know, it is a wonder drug as far as the med it isn't recognized yet, but it is going to be uh, seen like penicillin was in 1941. It was so 
remarkably non-toxic. It was so inexpensive once it was produced on an economy of scale. And it had enormous versatility. <coughs> Treat many gram-positive infections, even spirochetal infections. Well, marijuana has those three characteristics, too. And when we get to legalize it, the price will come down. The fact of the matter is that, that marijuana as a medicine should be as available as aspirin. Aspirin kills from a 1,000 from a to 2,000 people a year in this country. Marijuana has never killed anybody. So I, uh, I'm, I think I've probably exhausted my time, <laughs> as I usually do. So uh, again, I want to say that uh, I hope that this group as well as, uh, I think, other groups all around the country are rapidly going to move towards legalization because there are real problems with the so-called medical marijuana industry. Even that term bothers me. You know, uh, uh, if you take a, a drug like Lipitor, Lipitor, made by Pfizer, that's a 7 to 10, it's the biggest selling drug in the world. Seven to ten billion dollars. Now, the marijuana medical industry is said to be between 45 billion and 100 and some odd billion. You can't really tell because so much of it isn't really for medicine. It's for people who have a sore back. But in any event, uh, it's to me it's a shame that uh, that these people are being charged what they are. In these, med in these dispensaries because, uh, in fact, I estimate it to be about $45 an ounce when you do everything you want to be sure there's no fungi, all the things that have to be done. That's about what it would cost. And uh, the only thing that's keeping it up for medicine is the false competition. That is, they're competing with a street price. And that, I think, is, uh, is not a way we want it to go. It is a a medicine that was discovered by the people. It was a recreational drug that was discovered by the people. And the third area of use, enhancement of various human capacity, is also discovered by people. It is not something that should bring great profits to corporations. And I hope not only will we, will we achieve legalization, but in, suing, in doing that, then there will be price reduction. Thank you very much. Thank you.